uh, level of representation of chemistry. And what I'm trying to understand is sort of what is the formal way to think about these different levels of representation of chemistry for the purpose of understanding um, what one should be capturing when one tries to think about molecular biology and what should one be capturing when one tries to think about molecular computing. And so what are we actually talking about here? Well, um, the, the thing, so, you know, what happens in a chemical reaction? Well, basically there are a bunch of molecules. Let, let's imagine for a start, I mean, we've got, you know, solids, liquids, gases, they all have different situate, you know, different stories. And I, and I guess most of chemistry, we should think about being either liquid phase or gas phase rather than being, because once things are in solids, they're mostly, with the exception of catalysts and things like that, if I'm not mistaken, they're mostly, you know, that's not where most chemical processes that people study work. Is that a fair statement from chemistry people here? Or would people disagree with that? I mean, there's clearly geochemistry and things like that where different things happen. But, but for the most part, when one talks about doing chemistry, it's liquid or gas phase. Is that, is that true? Pretty much, but catalysts are also very important. I realize, as are yeah. membranes and, in, in, you know, in biology and so on. Yeah. I mean, yeah. in other words, the, the what happens on a surface is a critical story, and we'll talk about that a bunch. But mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, in terms of the, uh, you know, there's going to be a chemical reaction and something's going to happen. It's mostly, I mean, to what extent is it gas phase and to what extent is it liquid phase in typical like industrial uh, chemical processes? In, most, in, 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 in chemical engineering, is it mostly, is it gas phase or liquid phase most of the time? I, I would say uh, liquid phase most of the time, especially for uh, bioreactors and things like that. There is some gas phase that's done, uh, petroleum industry and cracking and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So in a first approximation, you know, what happens in a chemical reaction is you've got a bunch of molecules and they're bouncing around and the molecules and there are reactions that can happen where typically two molecules come in and some number of molecules come out. Is that a fair sort of uh, simple-minded characterization of what we're talking about? Pretty much. And two come in is the right number, right? It's not one, it's not three, it's two typically. Well, in decomposition, it can be one goes in and several come out, right? Yeah. You do have some term molecular reactions where you have three. You don't get more than that usually. Okay, all right. So. So then what we're talking about is, I mean, the, the form of reactions. And, and by the way, have, what is the state of our curation of reactions? Do we have, do we yet have, I mean, like the name reactions, if I look through the name reactions book, will I see, so I'll, I'll see mostly, mostly, you know, two goes to N, oops. Um, and uh, occasionally, uh, one plus heat or something goes to N. Is that a fair, fair statement? Or is that, um, would, would that be a fair, I mean, or are there other situations that happen? Is, I assume we'd be focusing on the rate determining step there. I'm, I'm interested in any chemical reaction, not necessarily the thing that is on the critical path, so to speak. Yeah, for a, a fundamental reaction step from one uh, ground state over a transition state to the next one, uh, this would be what would be happening. Okay. All right. So then, then sort of the, okay, the basic phenomenon is going to be, so we can, we can, in our kind of formalism, what we will have is a token event graph and um, which means, and this is where, um, Okay, so let's say we have a token event graph and let's say we have, um, let's say our chemical species are labeled just one and two. Then, then presumably what we have is we have certain reactions that can happen. A one and a two can turn into, I don't know, a three and a four, for example. And then we might, well, okay, this would be the most simple-minded thing. Then we would start off with like a collection of ones and a collection of twos. And... Um, Let's see if I say something like this. Okay, so what is this looking like? So this is this is saying, oh, this has this has token deduplication. So let's let's say 
token deduplication goes to false. Okay, so what this is claiming to show is each possible, this is sort of all possible chemical reactions between those molecules, right? Each, each molecule here, maybe I should take one less here. Each molecule can interact with any other molecule. And those molecules are just in a set of molecules, so to speak. There's no, there's no dependence on, um, uh, I mean, so this is, okay. So this claims to be representation of all possible reactions uh, independent of molecular location. Is this making any sense? I mean, so we, we can yep. take- And it's independent of time also. Yes. And uh, uh, independent of molecular location and any exogenous factors. Yeah, okay. 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 So this is, so now the, I mean, I, I'm, let, let's unravel a couple of things. So, I mean, right now, okay. So this represents all possible reactions in, well, okay. So there's several different things to say here. I mean, one, one thing is we're not distinguishing the ones and twos here, for example. So things to add, e.g., uh, you know, location of the molecules. Are they in different compartments, for example, in, in some, um, or are they, um, uh, um, or I don't know, what, what other aspects? Okay, so the physical location in space, um, and by a compartment, you assume a well-stirred compartment so that everything is equally likely to be near something else? Well, that right. So this, this is, okay. So here, okay. Implicitly assuming, we're implicitly assuming here, uh, implicitly assuming well-stirred. And we're, we're what? Like exogenizing things like activation energy for, for these reactions? Um. We're assuming the reaction just happens. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So yeah. it's rolled up into the yellow dot, right? Yes, exactly. Um, and if the reaction doesn't happen, then we don't include it here. Right. And, and we're not, now we're also, we're not characterizing it. So another thing we could characterize, obviously, is the energy. I mean, in, in general, microscopically, right? Microscopically, there are different energies these molecules could have, you know. Uh, I mean, in, in, um, Microscopically, uh, molecules can have different energies, um, which will allow them to participate in different reactions. And the energies are, you know, energies are roughly determined by temperature, you know, according to some Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. Actually, here's a question for, for you guys. Um, how accurately, are, I mean, in a gas, in gas phase, presumably it's pretty accurately Maxwell Boltzmann distributed. The, the energy as a function, you know, at a given temperature, the energy distribution is Maxwell Boltzmann, presumably, although there'll presumably be, even in a Van der Waals gas, there are presumably deviations from that. Is that a true statement? I believe so, yeah. But I mean, clearly, you know, in a, a you know, so I mean, my question is, in a first approximation, the temperature provides a one parameter family of energy distributions. And although that might not actually be the energy distribution um, and that, cause it depends on, yeah, okay. But, but that's but roughly each molecule. I mean, ultimately, you know, a, uh, a molecule, you know, has X and P, you know, it has, a, and, and presumably, I don't know, you guys, th th what internal degrees of freedom matter? Just for clarity, what's X and P? Is that uh, position of momentum. In... No, oh. position of momentum. Sorry, yeah. physics. <laughs> yeah, <So>. okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, um, I'll write it out. In, in, um, I'm thinking uh, position X and momentum P. Okay, so that, that will be its usual. So, I mean, in, in physics speak, it will also have some angular momentum. It'll have some, uh, uh, and I don't know how that's characterized for chemistry purposes. I mean, for, for chemistry, presumably, 
you say, when you're thinking about a molecule, you say, what temperature is this reaction happening at? That's pretty much the only thing. And what's the concentration of these molecules? Is that a, a fair statement? Or do you say other things about the, I mean, you might talk about the chiral fraction, but those are actually different molecules. You don't talk, for example, about the vibrational states of the molecule, do you? Or the rotational states of the molecule in determining the chemical reaction rates? Generally, no, not for the bulk, but if you're doing uh, micro scale simulations, you know, like uh, molecular dynamics and things like that, then specific orientations at which molecules collide can be important. Yeah, but, but presumably, when you say I've got molecules in a liquid, you presumably assume that they take on all, I mean, unless it's a liquid crystal or something, that they take on all orientations with equal probability. Is that a true statement? Yeah. 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 Except if you had a liquid crystal where that wouldn't be true. No, they'd be ordered then, oriented. Okay, but then, so all orientations equal. What about vibrational excitations? Do you care or do you not account for that in chemistry? Are we talking a formal vibration excitation or just ex exciting the, the, say, the vibrational modes of the molecule? Because the vibrational modes of the molecule will correspond with the temperature. Yeah, and I think some people have done some uh, vibrational excitation to get particular reactions to occur, but, um, and I'm trying to remember how they've done the excitation. Usually it's a photon of light coming in, and it's this concept of using light as a catalyst. Okay, yeah, specific okay. infrared frequency, Jason? Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Okay, but so, so, you know, usually the internal degrees of freedom uh, will be distributed according to temperature is the claim. Unless there's a specific, unless EG uh, one excites them with a photon, one excites them with, with a specific non-thermal photon, basically. Yeah, you can do, there's some work done with strong fields, but then we're really getting esoteric at that point. I see, with magnetic fields or with something like magnetic fields. Uh, I think so. Right. Yeah. And I mean, uh, you know, in things where, where the reaction rate depends on the spin, orientation of spins, that's very exotic. Um, okay. So, I mean, when we think about, uh, you know, okay, let's see, or different positions. So, I mean, normally in a well stirred, so, okay. How, what fraction of chemistry that people care about usually is well stirred, so to speak? I mean, in chemical engineering, is well stirring the usual assumption or not? Yeah, it, I'm, I'm quite sure it is. And even in uh, flow systems, uh, reacting, reacting flow systems, uh, it's still generally well stirred because of the scale. Okay. You st you've still got, you know, lots and lots of molecules, even in that small space. Okay. Now, in biology, are things well stirred? I bet they're not. No. They're the exact opposite of that. Yeah, especially within a cell. Right. I mean, so, in, in plasma and things like that, you can consider well stirred, but within a cell, uh, no, it's not. It's chaotic. It's not ordered, but it's not well stirred either. I know. That's exactly the phenomenon we're about to get into. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the phenomenon we're about to get into is, you know, when you talk about chemistry and you talk about, you know, chemical rate equations, all this kind of thing, you're making this well stirred approximation. The question is, what can one do when one goes beyond the well stirred approximation? What does one do? Like in biology, if you're, you know, if, if I take a little piece of this chart and I say, you know, what is the rate of such and such a reaction? How do I figure that out? Well, it depends on where the enzymes are. Are they bound in a membrane, for example, in a mitochondrion for uh, something like the uh, tricarboxylic acid cycle or something like that? Um, you know, a lot, it depends a lot on exactly where the enzyme is. But okay, but so the enzyme, I mean, you're describing, you know, the enzyme is the catalyst basically that's making the reaction go. Yep. Is, is, um, okay. So then, but you're claiming, okay. So a claim about biology. Okay. Here's a question about biology. What reactions in biology happen without enzymes? Naive question, but, um, 
Oh, things like uh, the equilibrium of carbon dioxide and carbonic acid. Okay, so small uh, solution. Yeah, things like that. Um, okay, so is uh, it true that, that the large molecule reactions all require enzymes? Uh, for the most part, I think there might be some protein hydrolysis in the stomach because of the high acid pH. Okay. Um, okay, so when an enzyme is involved, the, I mean, in, okay, so then the question is, are the enzymes free floating or are they bound to a membrane? Both. Depends on the enzyme. Okay. Some of them require the membrane for stability and, and maintaining the correct structure for the active site or the availability of it. Um, and others are, you know, floating around in solution. How do they get bound to a membrane? Let's see, they come off the ribosome and that I don't know. They get folded by a chaperone generally. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they just attach the membrane. I mean, maybe thermodynamically, they may have mm -hmm. the property that when they attach, they don't detach. Well, um, they may be, they're, they're generally partially embedded. They're never strictly on the surface. And okay. they may be embedded enough that they pass all the way through and they, they have some uh, chains, uh, you know, either the, the C terminus or the N terminus floating freely on either side of the membrane as well. Okay. But so, so okay, another naive question. I mean, all these enzymes are proteins. True statement or not? Yes. Proteins with often with prosthetic groups, which means what? Uh, something like a uh, a heme uh, or something like that, or um, uh, certain cofactors. Um, so does does that mean they have a cage and they capture some other atom? Is that the basic idea? Uh, yeah, um, or the, there's some other uh, small molecule that's involved in the active site that helps catalyze the reaction but it's not part of the protein. It's, it's, it's just uh, non-covalently bound, but it's involved. I see. Uh, like uh, nicotinamid adenine, uh, boy, biology has been so long ago, I'm forgetting the names. Uh, fair enough. But, but okay, yeah. so, I mean, here's, here's the thing that I'm, you know, the thing I'm interested in is this statement. Okay, the question is, what is the formalism that we can use for chemistry that is beyond the kind of traditional, you know, like, like all the chemistry we put into like Wolfram Alpha for people, you know, for people studying chemistry. It's all about essentially implicitly assuming well-stirred reactions. Is that a fair statement? I mean, all the stoichiometry, all that kind of stuff, all the reaction dynamics stuff is all assuming you know, what in physics one would call molecular chaos um, in chemistry, I guess you're calling well stirring. Yeah, all the thermodynamics, all of that stuff would be well stirred. Yeah, right, so <clears throat> go ahead. I was just gonna say it's all equilibrium dynamics up until you get to grad school, basically. Okay, so that what, what you're saying, okay, so AKA quotes equilibrium dynamics. So, when you deviate from equilibrium dynamics, what, what, what things in chemistry quotes deviate from quotes equilibrium dynamics? Is that studied or is that not particularly studied? Well, it's the whole field of non-equilibrium non -equilibrium chemical thermodynamics. Well, which means in practice what? Does that mean reaction diffusion equation type things? Or does that mean something more? I mean, because that's not, that's macroscopically not in equilibrium, but microscopically, I don't think there, you know, there are deviations from, you know, I don't think one's expecting there are major deviations from Maxwell Boltzmann. And, you know, one is not expecting non equilibrium at the level of Boltzmann's equation. One is expecting non equilibrium at the level of uh, sort of macroscopic concentrations, I think. I see. Isn't. Uh... Isn't violation of detailed balance one way that people talk about this? I was just about to ask if this is the detailed balance situation. Yeah. So, well, so, you know, a reaction rate sort of has an asymmetry going in one direction or the other direction. One rate is larger than another. 
but but okay but but you know quantum mechanical unitarity means that ultimately but I'm, I'm confused by that statement detailed balance in the usual when we're talking about reactions particle reactions and things detailed balance is essentially a statement of unitarity in quantum mechanics isn't it what what does detailed balance mean in chemistry or in, in this um uh what what does this mean so in other words you have a reaction and it is you know normally there's time reversal invariance in most microscopic physical processes so what but 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 perhaps i mean chemistry is weird because among other reasons because you know like for example electric dipole moments are impossible in theory for particles like a neutron can't have an electric dipole moment according to uh, uh you know well it, it violates time reversal invariance for example for the neutron to have an electric dipole moment yet a water molecule happily has an electric dipole moment how can this possibly be based on quantum mechanics and the answer is because a water molecule as it is usually thought about in chemistry is a giant superposition of quantum mechanical states it isn't you know it's not a single state and, and so most of the electric dipole moment is mostly transition dipole moments between those states which in chemistry you consider to be the same state but in quantum mechanics you don't that was a super confusing digression perhaps um but explain the, the statement about violation of detail balance and how that shows up in chemistry somebody so I was the person who brought this up originally, and I really don't know that much about it. But my understanding was that if you have some sort of uh, chemical reaction, which takes A to B um, with some reaction rate, that the reaction B to A has the same reaction rate under detailed balance. And that's sort of one way of talking about, um, indeed, I guess, right. thermal equilibrium. And then, and then sort of a deviation from equilibrium would be one of those reaction rates is no longer the same as the other. But that's a very sort of crude understanding. Right. But I mean but, but doesn't that have to do with the 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 free energy difference between the, the reactant ground state and the transition state and the product ground state and the transition state? That's what gives them different rates forward and reverse. Right. So so in physics, okay, I'm I'm trying to translate here. In particle physics, the same issue comes up. And this is a question of so-called phase space. That is, if you have a particle reaction, for, for example, let's say you have uh, one particle that decays into two, and you also have the possibility of the reverse reaction of two particles turning into one particle. Um, the, the reason those reactions will occur at different rates is because the, the phase space, the um, uh, possible set of, of momentum states that you get is different in the two cases. So in other words, it's not that the intrinsic rate is different. In the physics case, the S matrix, I think in chemistry, people talk about R matrices rather than S matrices. Is that true? Anybody know the, the um, you know, an S matrix is the, is the you know, in quantum mechanics is the, is the matrix that gives you the, the um, uh, you know, given the initial state, it gives you the final state. I think the R matrix, I think S is equal to one plus R if I remember correctly. Um, but that may not, I mean, that's, but yeah, so, so I think the translation of what you're saying about free energy has to do with what in microscopic physics we'll be talking about phase space, I think. Um, and I, I don't know, can you, can you translate what, what the, um, what is the microscopic version of what you're saying about free energy? Bob, I was hoping. Yeah, um, I'm thinking, uh, <laughs> I've just, always understood it as you know the free energy of the individual molecules in the transition state you know those differences being what is effectively uh controlling the rates in, in a given direction um okay let, let's unpack that for a second let's talk about entropy and then let's go to free energy okay okay first question is what is entropy and the answer uh, sort of at a logical level entropy is the log of the number of states of a system consistent with a certain constraint you've imposed on it. Right. Okay. Right. That's the, right. that's the sort of logical definition of entropy. So what is the logical definition of free energy in the same, same terms? Isn't it S plus Delta H or something like that? Jason. Well, yes. 
yes, it, it, there are formulas like that, but those do not help us because enthalpy is a, is a mess, I think, in terms of by the time we've got, <laughs> you know, by the time we've got anything involving temperature, we've already put a lot of detailed physics in. We've already got maxwell boltzmann distributions and all kinds of stuff in there. Yeah, and the question is, what's the kind of logical version of this? And I think, well, go ahead. I, I, I think it has to do with when you separate the phase, when you, okay, entropy, as described here, is energy independent. That is, there is no, you're just saying, how many states of the system are consistent with this constraint? Like having all the molecules and the gas in this box or something. Mm -hmm. and, and then you say, well, actually, I want to put an additional constraint. I want to talk about the energy of the system, which microscopically is conserved. Um, now, again, that's a mess because as soon as you do the canonical ensemble and statistical mechanics and you have a temperature, you have it, things in equilibrium with the heat bath, the heat bath doesn't conserve energy because it's having, and so, you know, so that's kind of a messy situation. But I, I think that um, this is somehow, it's related to saying, Let's not look at all. Let's let's look at states of the system which have the additional constraint that they have a certain energy. For example, actual physical energy, not mm -hmm. not free energy. Can, can somebody unpack this? Am I on the right track, or is this? Am I going off 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 track here? You're saying that the energy in the system that's like some sort of constraint, and then you're trying to estimate the amount of work that can be done in the system under that constraint. Well, fixing the energy is the microcanonical ensemble, and that's something people never do in talking about statistical mechanics or, I'm sure, chemistry. I mean, the, the, the idea of the, you know, the standard idea in, in, in statistical and thermodynamics is things are in equilibrium with a heat bath, and the heat bath is at a certain temperature. But what is temperature? Temperature is, you know, can be thought of as the average kinetic energy of things but in more detail the heat bath is continually absorbing and emitting particles with uh you know with a range of energies typically the maxwell boltzmann distribution of energies yeah, okay. where the average is you know half kt per degree of freedom or whatever but that's not the um but the the, the full thing the main point is the heat bath does not conserve energy you, you've got this this big blob of stuff yeah, yeah, sure. and you can you can um uh, okay and people almost never talk about the microcanonical case which does conserve energy um so i i claim it's going to get fairly confusing because i think you can talk about what are the number of states of the system of a given energy consistent with some constraint like for example yeah, right. you could perfectly well talk about the microcanonical version of a chemical reaction where you say i've got ab going to cd or something like this and I can say how many states of the system have A and B in, uh, yeah, I mean, in, in, in a certain, right, in the, let's say it's A, B goes to C, D, E. The, the entropy, the number of states of the C, D, E system will be quite different from the number of states of the A, B system, even at fixed energy. And I, I think that's, I mean, again, uh, I mean, okay, when I think about a chemical reaction, should I think about it as the molecules have a certain kinetic energy? They, okay, na another naive question about chemistry, okay, and this relates to whether it's liquid phase, gas phase, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in, okay, okay, really basic question. When the molecules have a certain kinetic energy, the only exchange of energy is through collisions between molecules. True statement. Unless you have some photon, you know, some some radiative heating from the outside. Normally, the the primary exchange of energy is through molecular collisions. Yes. 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 That's right. Okay. That, that's kinetic molecular theory. Right. So okay. So then, then in a chemical reaction. The way we think about it is the molecules have got some kinetic energy based on all of the collisions that they have, which are el presumably, okay, another naive question. Presumably, most collisions are elastic collisions rather than collisions in which a reaction occurs. Is that a true statement? It must be. Yeah, yeah, because uh, 
they have to have the right orientation to to have the reaction take place. Right. Well, okay. So, okay. So most collisions in in a you know quotes chemical process are elastic. So the way we might think about this is um, you know the the elastic collisions knit together the structure of the liquid or gas. Yeah. Yeah. And every so often, there's a collision that is an inelastic uh, reaction producing collision. Yep. So are you, are you really making the claim that the molecular orientation is critical to whether the reaction happens? It has to be close. I mean, it doesn't have to be exact, but it has to be close. Wow, I didn't know that. Okay. I mean, so, so okay. So molecular orientation... Um, okay. That's interesting. I mean, because again, maybe we, the particle physics moment, okay. Nothing like that can happen in particle physics for the same reason as that neutron electric dipole moment statement that I was making. That is you with a water molecule, you get to say, I have a water molecule in a certain orientation. You can never say that with, uh, with, with particles that have, um, are in individual quantum states. You don't get to have that orientation story told in the same way. Does that make any sense? I mean, in other words, you, you the ground state, okay, look, the, the um, okay, quantum mechanics moment. The true ground state of a water molecule has to be rotationally invariant. That is, the true ground state is something where there's a, there's a where all the orientations have equal amplitude i believe yes i believe that's correct and, and then so so then the fact that you say it's a water molecule in a certain orientation is a statement that the thing is actually in a superposition of states that are not all the ground state it's not just in the ground state which that's is just, kind, yeah go ahead well okay and thinking about collisions so if the inelastic collisions are also the reactions, then these are basically the kinds of events that we've been studying so far. Whether or not inelastic collisions are like, you know, identity preserving events or something like that, uh, I'm not sure. But does this mean that basically if we kept track of all of the collisions, that is all the events, that we could, we could basically obtain a history of the energy transfer in the system, which is basically the, it's basically the causal graph. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, in other words, you'd be transferring vibrational energy from one molecule to another in one of these inelastic collisions. Right. Well, I mean, there are two levels. There's the inelastic collision where you just excite a vibrational mode, mm -hmm. and there's an inelastic collision where the whole molecule goes crazy and there's a reaction. Yeah. Um. So okay. So then the the um. Okay. So there's inelastic collisions. Um. Uh, and there's both both vibrational excitations, the vibrational and presumably rotational, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, rotational, et cetera. Uh, there, there's also uh, some reactions are, are uh, photochemical, uh, things like the Diels-Alder reaction, uh, where you have to excite uh, an electron to... Uh, get into a higher energy level so that the orbitals have the right symmetry so that they can react and, and do these uh, cyclization reactions. Okay. And where an infrared photon is emitted or something or what? You, uh, a photon is absorbed um, to do Not the anything. excitation. And then I don't remember what happens to it afterwards. Well, clearly, I mean, like in the GFP protein, I mean, you can clearly even get visible photons emitted in reaction. Yeah, but I, th I think that's different. Okay. Uh, here I'm talking about reacting something like 1,3-butadiene uh, with ethylene to form cyclohexene. And uh, that, de that, re that requires uh, photochemical excitation, I believe. It's, it, um, Basically, you're saying that the reaction occurs on the excited uh, potential energy surface rather than the ground state potential energy surface, or possibly uh, yeah. at a conical intersection of the two. 
I something see. like that. Yeah. Okay. The, you know, what, what's funny, I have to say, it's, it's we all get, you know, because I learned particle physics when I was a kid. So all these things, like I could tell you, you know, the, um, you know, uh, an excited k on state produced by this or that or the other thing. And that all sounds perfectly natural to me. But when you start talking about, you know, cyclohexene and so on, it just sounds like complete <laughs> gobbledygook. And, and, uh, and, and, and I'm hold, holding up the mirror and, you know, we're seeing each other on opposite sides <laughs> of this mirror, Stephen. <laughs> yeah, right, right. right. No, I, mean, it's just, it's, yeah, uh, I have no yeah. idea about that K thing that you just spoke of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right, right. I mean, the... Um, the only yeah. thing, that the pity about it is, you know, one might be, you know, 500 years too early in history for the particle physics reactions to be ones that are of sort of industrial relevance, so to speak. So, you know, one, one, um, anyway, okay. But, but, um, uh, but so just give me some sense. The, the actual, when molecules collide, what fraction of the time do they actually have a reaction? And what, what's the, I mean, to ask this question, so again, this is particle physics stuff, but I, I, I assume it applies in chemistry. You know, the reaction rate is the cross section, usually called sigma, times you know times some kind of flux, and presumably there is a cross section for these. You can you can work out the you know there's an elastic scattering cross section, there's an inelastic scattering cross section, there's a um, uh, um, there's a reaction cross section. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, I never okay. got into to peak him that deeply about it, but yeah, you're I, you're into the experimental kinetics area where they do collision theory and 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 they do talk exactly about what you're speaking of. Yeah, okay, uh, cross sections and, and relating it back to reaction rates. Um, yeah, okay, but I mean that that's a simple formula. I mean, I can I I know that formula. I worked it out once for the early universe. It, it's just um. Uh, it's n times sigma times v, where, where n is the number density, sigma is the cross section, and v is the velocity. That's, that's the, that tells you, because n times v is essentially a flux. It's telling you how many particles are, n is the number density, how many particles are moving, uh, are crossing a certain unit area. And the cross section sigma is telling you, you know, what is the effective, what, what cross sectional area do they have to hit for, that, for something to actually happen? Yeah, so, and, and that cross section would be some percent of the molecular surface or surfaces of the two molecules. Right. I would well, guess. But, well, yeah, but I mean, but that's the whole point. The, for the cross section, okay, cross section in like, like for proton proton collisions, okay? You know, the, I wonder if we have this. I bet we have. Let's see if we have the proton proton cross section. Actually, I bet Wolfram Alpha has it. Um, let's just see. Uh, so just to give, I mean, this is just a area that I sort of understand. Okay, there it is. Okay, so that's the cross section as a function of center of mass energy. So that's two protons are going to collide. This is the cross section area, cross section in millibonds. And so just to give you a sense. You guys are laughing at me. It's, it's, I know, because I'm remembering the definition of a barn. Yeah, right. Or the, where it came from. Indeed. The, the, so let's, let's see if we say unit convert. So the proton-proton total cross-section is roughly 40 millibonds. Um, it, it was used to be in the back in the day. There it was. It went up after that. Uh, it was kind of inflation. Um, let's see. 40 millibonds. Okay. Okay. So that's it in square meters and the square root of that. Well, let, let's just take that and, um, you know, roughly the square root of that is 10 to the minus 15 meters, which is roughly the physical size of a proton. Okay. Yeah. So roughly that, that is telling you when two protons get fired at each other, roughly they will interact with a, with a probability that is proportional of their cross-sectional area. But if we ask the electron-proton cross-section, we'd get a completely different result, but the electron does not have a physical size in that same sense. So maybe in the molecular case, we can think of it as, uh, 
you know, physical size. But what I'm guessing, like, like for example, if we look at the reaction, you know, um, you know, proton proton goes to lambda again. This is, I, it's almost embarrassingly silly. I mean, proton proton goes to lambda k, which wouldn't be very helpful. But but um, uh, you know, that's a reaction which has a certain probability. And just like the reaction of, you know, chemical A and chemical B has a certain probability to give C and D. Um, and that, that's a whole sort of story of how you compute those, those probabilities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a non-trivial thing in particle physics, and it's a non-trivial thing in chemistry, I believe. Um, but so what's the point of all of this? But what I'm, what I'm, what I'm trying to understand is, is it, you know, in a typical reaction setting, is it like once in a billion collisions there will be a reaction, or is it once in ten collisions there'll be a reaction, or what? That I don't know. Never had to get that detailed. Okay. Well, fair enough. All right, but but so probably be temperature dependent, right? Or maybe that's yes. obvious. Yeah, yes. it would be. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and presumably if it's an explosive reaction and things, that you know, there's there's a higher probability of reactions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, this is our rough picture that much of the time, so in this setup, what we really need to be adding is something which represents the knitting together of the fluid, where okay, so if we're purely doing fluid knitting, then this is what we would have. Why the heck does this look like this? Don't we, uh, Nick? There's a question about token event graphs. Don't can't we do a step by step token event graph where the instance of one uh, one step is different from the instance of subsequent steps? Oh, well, so well, that's but, what token deduplication is. But do we need Those to do event deduplication? I mean, the the what is the event deduplication? Well, when duplication, <clears throat> when duplication is, uh, it's it's already turned off by default, but it removes the events that have the exact same input and output tokens. Right. I think what we need here is something which we have in multi-way graph, which is this molecule here. The question is, is this molecule, is this one somehow the same as the one here? Or... Is it the case that every time there's been a this interaction, see, because because okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna compare this with, and maybe Matt can say how we do this for a hard sphere gas, which is why I wanted Matt to join us here because obviously this is highly related to that. Um, presumably, we have we have something like a token event graph for a hard sphere gas. Is that a true statement? We must do. I guess, I, I guess I'm just not really familiar with the language of token event graphs. The causal graphs are constructed from collision sequences for the hard space. Because right. right. they have no I internal understand. degrees of freedom, right? So that's basically all we have. Right. But well, let, let's actually see one of those. Can, can we bring up a, where, where can we get a causal graph for one of your hard sphere gases from? Um, the Wolfram function repository page should have one. Okay. Um, okay. Um, If not, I can I can screen share and just pull one up on my screen. Um, well, or, or send me the code. It would probably be better because we. Um, I suspect, yeah. Okay, it'll be it'll be there. Um, and the the code has gotten sort of simpler since then. But each one of the nodes is going to uh, represent a collision, and then the edges is going to be one particle that connects two collisions. Oops, collisions to causal graph. Yes, I'm sorry. This this code is not perfectly up to date, and, and the code at the moment is a little bit sprawling. So, okay, all right. But anyway, so this is this is collisions to causal graph. Okay, so now we're going to make here a. All right. So let me understand what this is. So, in our usual way of doing things, are these things? These are really yellow events. Is that correct? Uh, each okay. node represents a collision between two particles. Maybe, I mean, I thought Which, that Xerxes yeah, was here. He might be events. able to translate between uh, between these two graphical structures better than I can. Xerxes, do you have a comment? I'm less familiar with the token event graph, but in this one, 
each, uh, in, indeed, as Matt pointed out, each node corresponds to an event and the, uh, and, and, and the edges are just then denoting uh, how, how these events uh, causally connect or uh, causally connect to the following ones. And by causally connect, the carrier of causality is a hard sphere. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Okay. So just to explain token event graphs for a second, the the way that we're thinking about these, imagine, okay, in a hypergraph, for example, when we do hypergraph rewriting, what we're doing is we're taking some number of hyper edges, we're sort of combining them together, and we're getting some number of output hyper edges. So, for example, let, let me let me let me make an extreme claim here. Let, let's let's say that okay. Let, let's take our uh, typical example. Let me pull one up here. Um, hold on a second. Actually, yes. this is going to be amusing. I've got. Would a string rewriting system be simpler for the audience to follow? Uh, possibly yes. Uh, no, no, it isn't. It has a, it okay. has a horrible extra issue because of the question of where the character is within the string. Got it. Okay. That makes a horrible, I mean, it, it's, um, uh, okay. Let's, let's have a typical version of this. Okay. Yeah. So this is, um, okay. So I'm going to make an outrageous claim here. I'm going to claim this is just like a chemical reaction. I'm going to claim this hypergraph rewriting rule. What does this say? This says, um, if we say, let's see, I think if I do this, um, and then I say rule plot of this. No, I get it. it basically, the left-hand side, those are the, what, the reactants, the right-hand side of the products or something. Well, right? uh, what yeah. I'm going to claim is that, is that these every hyperedge is like a molecule. You know, the, the analogy, every hyperedge is a molecule. And then what's happening is, and I suppose in the, in the more real chemistry case, each molecule is a graph. And okay, so let's take, can we take some simple reaction that we can represent with graphs, with, with chemical? Oh, actually, there's an interesting difference here. There's an interesting difference. Okay, in, sorry, in the, the um, one difference here is that we can create atoms of space. We cannot yeah. create atoms in chemistry. Not very easily. <laughs> the, well, I, I suppose you, could, you can grab one from some other <laughs> substrate or something. Yeah, yeah. Or if the enzyme in biology, if the enzyme is giving something to it. Um, and there's always solvent around water to get incorporated. Oh, that's an important point, actually. We can create atoms of space, but in, in chemistry, we usually don't, except, from, yeah. except e.g. from a solvent. Yeah. Um, okay. But so, so what is the minimal way of thinking about? So, so uh, sorry, what's happening here is in terms of the token event graph, there are two tokens here. That's one token, that's another token. And this is turning into four tokens. And so the token event graph represents, and this, this uh, rule represents one event. Okay. So one reaction. As you say, that would be mm -hmm. one successful inelastic collision that produced a reaction. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Which, which in our world here is an event. Okay. That yellow event is two things come in. And, oh, I see. One of the trickinesses here, which is very non-PetriNet-like, is that we get to use, okay, that this, is, this, is where, this is where things are a little bit confusing. This molecule here is getting used in two different events, which is not the real situation. Not if you have right. an ensemble, right? The petri net represents an ensemble. Well, yes. This this again is the ensemble case. This is representing all possible reactions, mm -hmm. whereas in actuality, it can only follow one of these paths. Right. right. Then, then it gets used yeah. up. Then it gets right. consumed. Yep. Yeah. Right. But but so 
this thing here, this token event graph, like the PetriNet, is a representation of all possible reactions, not a representation of a particular actual reaction that took place. Mm -hmm. right. But in traditional chemistry, okay, so what, what I'm claiming is in traditional chemistry, you are uh, you're considering, you know, you conflate, you don't care which molecule was involved. You are well stirred, and all you care about is that there was a molecule with a certain concentration, mm -hmm. as opposed to that particular molecule there that underwent this reaction is now going to undergo another reaction. So, so part of the reason it matters, what this, this question about, about um, uh, you know, what fraction of the time you are having a reaction versus just having a collision is that if you think that the state of the molecule, let's say it's vibrational, um, you know, configuration or something mattered in a subsequent reaction step, then if it's going to have a million kind of collisions of, um, I mean, surely we can work this out. We know the collision rate in a liquid, for example, we can quite easily work that out. And we know the reaction rate from the, you know, rate constants of the reaction. The question is, what is the difference? What's the, uh, what is, you know, the orders of magnitude between the collision rate and the reaction rate? What, what are the units of reaction rate? It's a very naive question for you. This is where I should have learned my elementary chemistry, but what are the units? Is, is there? It's usually something like, uh, if either you know it's per unit time or uh per moles per unit time okay so if it's moles per unit time no no, no not moles per unit time but um per just, mole per yeah if, if it's a bimolecular reaction then it's per mole per unit time for example right and, and they're dependent on the type of reaction yeah well, they right. can have different dimensions right like they can be Correct. moles squared Right. Or, or Depending yeah. on how many molecules are involved. Exactly. In right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so we're going to be able to untangle this because this is, okay. So what the question is, um, rate of collision versus rate of reaction. Surely we can answer this just orders of magnitude. I mean, let me, let me see. Maybe we can just, maybe there's just some easy, um, there is one equation. I'm not quite sure on the pronunciation of this. I think it's called the Erring equation. And there's one um, co uh, constant in there called the transmission coefficient. And I'm pretty sure that's the ratio between the number of collisions and the uh, number of collisions that result in the reaction. This isn't the Arrhenius equation or something. No, the it's, Erring equation has to do with kinetics at different temperatures, I believe. Um, I never actually had to use it, but it is used, I believe, in trying to determine uh, reaction rates from uh, variable temperature NMR experiments. Okay, so let's. How is that spelled? We can just look it up. Um, it's an ER, right? Yeah. E Y R I N G. Put it in the chat. Oh, the ER chat. Yeah. Is Joseph about to learn how this name is pronounced? The, anybody, I would not be surprised. But what is the pronunciation just for everybody's? Um, okay, so this is this equation. Yeah. Okay, so it does resemble the Arrhenius equation. Okay. Help. Changes in the rate of chemical reaction against temperature. I think that's a little different. Look, what we want. The, this is this is a standard question. I mean, this this we got to be able to know how this works. Um, okay, well, I, I'm going to assume that the actual answer is uh, we can work it out later. That the actual answer is very small. That is that the that most of the time most molecules, uh, you know, have many collisions between any two reactions, like millions at least of collisions between any two reactions. If it wasn't the case, I mean, my guess is that that's what happens in some, you know, dramatic explosive situation. That's a situation where you, you know, if you're going to have a fluid, you better have a bunch of elastic interactions happening. 
Otherwise, you're not going to have a fluid. You're just going to say sure. it's this thing that's just blowing up somehow. Um, yeah. The, okay. So, so the question here is, I mean, in okay, coming, coming back to a chemical reaction, as I understand it. So, so what, what's a good example? Maybe somebody can give me just a, you know, some name reaction type thing where it's like one graph plus another graph goes to two other graphs. Is that a, a typical kind of way to think about this? Yeah, well, this one might be too simple. Uh, but for example, um, reacting uh, uh, chloromethane with uh, a bromide or a fluoride ion to give you um, bromomethane plus a chloride ion. I was going to do fluorine plus H2 just because it's well studied, but yeah. Yeah, that would, that would do the same thing. Okay, so we've a got... A similar thing, yeah. Help, what's happening here? Why am I taking... Why is this taking any significant time? What's it doing? That was really boring. Okay, well, I was there hoping... are three hydrogens that aren't shown, so... Yeah, okay, well, let's... Um... The 3D plot might be a little more exciting. Yeah. I mean, I chose that one because orientation would be important. Okay. Um, but so, okay, so then it's plus some other thing. And then basically we are rearranging, you know, we're just rearranging these bonds. We're rearranging the graph. And that's kind of our representation for a chemical reaction. Bob, what, kind of, what kind of reaction is it? it it's uh, an SN1 reaction uh, where uh, the... Uh, other halide ion comes in and displaces the chlorine. It comes in from uh, the side that has all the, pro the hydrogens on it, and it, it effectively pushes the other one out on the other side. Is it necessarily SN1, not SN2? Excuse me, this is SN2, yes, by molecular, sorry. Okay, but, but so... I mean, just, I'm, I'm just still just trying to understand. Our, our representation of things in the end is going to be, you know, some graph and, and, you know, okay. Another question in most of the time in, in molecular biology, we're dealing with, we're dealing with, well, I guess that it's not always ordinary bonds, right? There are hydrogen bonds and other kinds of, other kinds of weak binding. Mm -hmm. that's also important. Yeah. And, um, but, and when we represent a molecule, by a graph, we're usually imagining that those are all covalent bonds. Is that a true statement? And we draw dotted lines for hydrogen. Dotted, yeah, dotted lines for hydrogen bonds. You can consider them you know, in a graph sense as, as additional edges, mm -hmm. um, but they would have uh, different characteristics chemically. Okay, but, but so roughly what we're doing here is we've got, I mean, you know, a chemical reaction is something where, unlike this, where we can create atoms of space, we are effectively just rearranging graphs. And mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, if if we want to do that, then Jason's example of of uh, F minus plus H two to give you H F plus uh, H minus would work. Okay. Or is it is it a fluorine radical, Jason? Um, I believe it's just a neutral fluorine plus H2. Okay. Plus H2 okay. would then give you HF plus, a, uh, plus H. Right. right. I understand. These are, these are simple. Okay. Yeah. But, but so. I, I think if we're using a token of n graph, yeah, something like a substitution reaction where we're basically replacing functional groups, I, I think that should be a good example. Because we've been thinking about substitution in terms of pattern matching anyway for meta mathematics. I'm not sure if substitution means exactly the same thing, but I'd like to see, yeah, like to well, see how, uh, how smooth that, that translation is from uh, automated theorem proving to, um, to, to chemistry. So you're thinking like AX plus B goes to A plus BX? Well, we're seeing here as, a, as an example you know, the, um, okay. 
Right. Yeah. yeah that. Right. Okay. Put the photon. Okay. So this is. Mm -hmm substitution reaction and now what we're used to i'm still a little bit confused because there's a little uh, different than okay like yeah that that reaction there is a multi-step reaction actually mm -hmm. you well, first okay. have the dissociation of the chlorine into uh chloride radicals all right, what's it, in, in, in the world of name reactions, for example, is there just some reaction where, I mean, you can, you, you typically, you have something where it has a little R on it, right? And then you're, I mean, do we, don't we have this capability in our chemistry um, system? Don't we, don't we have the capability of having something with, with you know, a molecule with a, with a pattern piece on it, which we can We're then- We're getting there. We're getting yeah. there. We've been talking okay. about it the past several weeks. There's a number of uh, complications that you run into trying to abstract it out to more generic groups. Yeah, it, it's non-trivial. Right, but okay, but in a, in a first approximation, can we think of it as we've got a graph and a node of the graph is something which could correspond to some, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's like having something like f of x blank, you know, y blank, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, where, where you can put in different sort of radicals or something in place of some, uh, you know, some pattern variable in your uh, molecular pattern, so to speak. Don't we? Yeah. Have, don't we even have a molecule pattern? Yes, we do. What does molecule pattern do if it doesn't do this? Doesn't molecule pattern ge generally do like a sub uh, substructure of a molecule? That's that's what it represents. Yeah, yeah. The the radical or, or the R group uh, is is not implemented yet. I see. So wait a minute. So this is just for subcasing a molecule that has this particular subset of atoms and bonds. Yeah. Okay, but then right there's the, the possibility uh, of an arbitrary piece to to add to that. Yes, that, and that's what we're. You know, we're, I mean, we're, in general, when you make a molecule expression, you can just use an asterisk as the uh, um, uh, as the the atom symbol, and it'll show up as an asterisk in the in the plot. Um, and we're like, so can I do that? Options. So if I say something like CCC, yeah, like this. Okay, and what what happens if I say molecule plot of this? Oh, I see. So that represents something which could as well be something other than just a carbon there. Yep. Could be nitrogen, could be oxygen, could be phosphorus. But it is necessarily a specific atom because when you uh, replace like the single atom with some sort of functional group, then it also has uh, issues with chirality. So uh, possibly, um, yeah, in, in principle, that asterisk could be either just a single atom or it could be a group that has two hairs coming out of it to match those two bonds. Yes, but the, the comment about chirality might be something that uh, back in the day when I was trying to do the physics project back in the 1990s, one of the things I was super confused about is cases where the symmetry of the rewritten graph is lower than the symmetry of the original graph. That is where essentially an arbitrary choice has to be made about what the orientation is. And what I realized in more recent times is that's exactly where multi-way graphs come in, that that all possible such orientations can occur. And maybe, and then, maybe that's not, go ahead. And then that restores the symmetry, right? Well, the symmetry is restored in the full multi-way graph. Yeah. It's restored in the ensemble, but it's not, but any individual uh, choice breaks the symmetry. But the whole point is that I had not really understood that the symmetry can be preserved by looking at the ensemble. And I had wanted the symmetry to be preserved in the individual case, which sounds like the same kind of thing you have here. If you have some chiral structure, it's like, well, you can't preserve the symmetry. You don't know which way to put it on. Um, but if you say, well, I'm going to put it on in all possible ways, then that's still okay. Yeah, well, in this case, the, the two things on each side of the asterisk are the same. So the, the symmetry doesn't... Okay. Uh, show up in this particular case if one of them was shorter or longer 
then we could replace that asterisk with something that had, uh, you know, that itself uh, was was dissymmetric, and then you would break the sim, you know, you would have Fair the uh, symmetry situation come up. All right, I want to zoom out again, okay? Because the thing thing I'm trying to understand is this graph, which is hard sphere gas, could be the causal graph. This could be, okay, it could be the case that most of these are elastic collisions, as they are in the case of this um, hard sphere gas. These are all elastic collisions in the hard sphere gas. But it could also be that some selected ones of these, one in a million or something, are not. So these are all two to two nodes. Is that correct, Matt? Is that right? That, that has is to correct, be. yes. Yeah. Why does that one, for example, look like it's a two to one node? That might just be a result of the this, this small number of simulation steps. I mean, this is only run for 50 steps um, because these graphs become enormous very quickly. Okay, fine. But, but, so, but basically what we're saying is this is microchemistry, so to speak. This is, this is a level of chemical... Okay, normally when we show a chemical you know, process as a graph... What we're saying, the nodes of the graph are, for example, whole chemicals, whereas here, the nodes of the graph are collision events. Yeah, and it's the dual, a, as it were. Right. And in a token event graph, we are showing both the, uh, we're showing each molecule. Yes, e each molecule and it is consumed by an event, which is a collision. And then we're saying that there are, quotes, new molecules produced, which might happen to be uh, of the same type as the molecules that came in. But new molecules are produced coming out of the event. Mm -hmm. right? So here, here we've only got the events shown, and we're carrying. We don't know whether this guy coming in here is, is the one that goes out here or is the one that goes out there. And the token event graph clarifies whether we are even distinguishing the two things that come out, which we might not be. Right. Now, in, in chemistry, I think it's very similar to your oriented water molecule business. My guess is you usually say, you don't just say, and then there was a reaction, and out of it came these two products, and we don't know which came from which. Is that a fair, I mean, in other words, what am I trying to say? If you have a big molecule and you knock a little piece off it, you kind of know that the, you know, it's sort of the big molecule is going through on one of these edges and the little piece, uh, so I'm saying it doesn't, it's not just turning into an undifferentiated, okay, and, and like particle physics, if I say, you know, proton, proton goes to lambda k on or something, um, or uh, you don't say, Usually, oh, well, actually, that's a bad example. But, but, um, uh, I mean, it's not just that you didn't see which proton turned into which uh, lambda well, muon. Are it's just that you fundamentally can't know, right? Or is that different? Well, no, it's it's the same. It's the same thing. So, so the issue is the quarks inside one of the protons. If you say, did that quark end up in the kaon, or did that quark end up in the lambda particle? So now the question for chemistry would be, the analogous question is, did that carbon atom end up in that product or in the other one? And you do think you know that, typically. So yeah. people will do studies, like you, can, like you can isotopically label parts and watch yeah. them, but it's nice. still a macroscopic nice. thing. Um, yeah, and it has to be a reaction where uh, it, it's somewhat symmetric. For example, if, if you have H plus, reacting with H2 to form uh, H2 plus H plus, you, you're exchanging one of the hydrogen atoms. Mm -hmm. And in the transition state, you've got three, had, three hydrogen atoms loosely bound together and it could dissociate going back to reactants and the hydrogen on the left is the one that comes out, which was the one that went in, or it could go on to, you know, quote unquote products um, where the hydrogen on the right is the one that comes out uh, and forms the H plus, and but, in that way, you know the you know the the H plus is indistinguishable. 
Okay, but so is it or is it not the case? I mean, when I look at a typical, you know, name reaction, big complicated thing with big complicated molecules, normally it was my understanding that you can say, oh, in this product molecule, the, the, the carbon that was in this, in this molecule came from the carbon that was in this place in this incoming molecule. For the most part, you can. Uh, if the, uh, one of the molecules has two different places where the reaction could take place, in other words, uh, something like uh, diethyl, uh, um, uh, not propionate. Um, okay, a dicarboxylic acid that's a, that's a diester. Like diethyl melanate? Yes, diethyl melanate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, melanate is, uh, malonic acid is a three carbon uh, acid with uh, a, a carboxylic acid at each end of the molecule. Um, and each of those are esterified to ethyl alcohol. And if you hydrolyze one of them, you don't know which one, the, the one it. carbon or the three carbon were hydrolyzed unless you've labeled the carbon somehow yeah, right. uh, with uh, you know C14 or C13 or something like that. I'm just, this is a curiosity sure, yeah. question. Sure, sure. Oh yeah, no, go ahead. But does, it, does it matter? I mean, in quantum mechanics, you know, there will be sort of the scattering amplitudes will depend on whether they're identical particles and things like this. Does it actually measurably matter if you label the things? Does the quantum mechanics kind of bite you and change, change probabilities by factors of two and stuff like this? Not factors of two, but uh, the different mass, uh, okay. especially if you use a stable isotope, you will see that effect. Okay, but that's just from the isotopic mass. What I was wondering yes. is whether the identical particle effects in quantum mechanics were broken by having a you know a traceable thing happening there. Well, probably not in chemistry. <laughs> not the chemistry I've done. Yeah, well, um, right. I mean, th this is the, this is the no. big lie of chemistry. I mean, chemistry is not as quantum mechanical as you think. Um, the I mean, because the it, it's, it's the electrons not, that are acting quantum mechanically rather than the nuclei. Well, yes. I mean, so you get into yeah. proton tunneling. There's the there's a whole recent field of this stuff. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Where you you yeah. Um, oh, what's her name? Uh, she's a professor over at the uh, University of Pennsylvania that's working on this stuff. Hmm. Anyway, so we can come. The, back okay, to so it. there's a, there's a okay. So the, I mean, I think the the basic point in in chemistry versus quantum mechanics tends to be this idea that in chemistry there is continual measurement going on by virtue of sort of the interaction with the outside world of the molecules, which I think is the analog of the statement that, uh, you know, is, is not unrelated to the statement that there are co elastic collisions happening that knit together the structure of the, 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 the medium, so to speak. But okay, but but I'm I'm still want to come back to okay. So what we've got here, this is our sort of micro micro version of of chemistry, um, in which what we could have in Matt's picture here is most of the time these are just elastic collisions. But every so often, there's a you know a bright red dot there, and that's a reaction. Mm -hmm. And so this is, and now. In this version, what we have elided is the actual positions of the of the molecules. All we've got is causal information. Yeah. And the question, I suppose, okay, so we've got causal information and we've every so often, so what we don't have here is we could label the edges with um, the type of molecule it is. So in other words, in the simplest case that Matt is initially looking at with hard spheres, you know, he has only one kind of hard sphere. But in principle, he could have something where, you know, an A plus an A goes to an A plus a B or something as a hard sphere reaction, so to speak. That makes sense. And then we would have a, in, in th this is a single, you know, run of the of the um, of the simulation. So this is this is not showing the same things we showed in the token event graph, which was a multi-way, all possible, uh, you know, recombinations of events, mm -hmm. just a single one. And so, but what we could do here is we could label this with um, uh, 
you know, with the with the type of molecule that each edge corresponds to. I mean, the thing I'm trying to understand. Okay, so what I'm going for is that I'm claiming that there are different levels of of um. So, for example, if we take, uh, you know, if if we have something like you know, um, you know, so different, you know, different levels of description. And, you know, this is sort of that level of description is one of the coarsest levels of description because it's just saying, um, and that's the same level of description I would imagine as when you describe a synthesis pathway or something and all you're showing is the network of what chemical uh you know interacts with what other chemical to produce what what chemical not nothing about individual molecules just in the aggregate this chemical species interacts to produce this other one yep uh, um so and in terms of the kinds of systems we've studied a i mean is it the case then that that's somewhat like one of our, gosh, I don't really know. It's, I mean, we, we've often claimed, okay, let me bring up an example here, um, that uh, I'm slower than sometimes because I've managed to hurt my mouse finger. So I'm having to use my right hand for a mouse, which is not my natural way of doing things. Um, but let's, uh, okay, so let's say our typical, okay, so let's say this, this might be our typical kind of chemical reaction network. That's a slightly weird one. Actually, see, the problem with this is it's not actually representing what would normally be there, which is two to two reactions. I have a question about this, which is, we were discussing before, you know, Matt's graph. That graph is composed solely of events. Now, some of those events are actual reactions, and some of them are basically, I don't know what you want to call them, like identity preserving events, or they're just collisions, but they're not actually, uh, you know, facilitating any, any reactions. But the question is, let's say, so let's say you had some token event graph that corresponded to that causal graph. Well, how would you generate it? Because like, what rules would you specify for a graph where sometimes you have reaction events and sometimes you just have these collision events? How rulely would we, I mean, are we interested in general in having, in capturing, you know, non-reaction, just collisions in these kinds of graphs? And if so, how are we going to distinguish between those rulely when we specify the rules that, that govern the generation of them? Well, because because the whole point is that an elastic collision takes an A and a B and produces an A and a B, whereas a reaction takes an A and a B and produces a C and a D. So you're saying if we just include like these identity preserving rules, yes, and we just include those in the graphs. Uh-huh. Okay, we include those in the graphs, and then we just get collisions. We get collisions. Actually. Oh, so you're, okay. Well, that, that, that was exactly right. what we yeah. did in in looking right. at this um, uh, for this economics model. Looking at those are what we were calling autonomous, you know, autonomous events in an economic system of just random, you know, sort of I, I don't know what they would what the it, it's just sort of a I don't know a random price check or something. It isn't quite a price check, but something like that, where nothing actually really happens, but you are. Uh, I mean, okay. The thing that's really confusing is that in physics or in math simulation, something does happen. The momenta are changed. The thing, the thing, you know, bounces. One one hard sphere bounces off another hard sphere, and they change. They reverse their momenta. Um, but in terms of the identity of the objects, they don't change. Well, that's so, yes. That's what I was going to ask. Actually, is that because what really determines whether or not it's just a collision or it's a reaction is the actual, you know, orientation of the molecules. The question is, are we going to describe rules at that level of detail or not? Or are we just going to include these identity events that basically serve as non-reaction collisions? 
Look, what we need to do, first of all, is to consider two to two string rewriting, which I think I've done in the past. So assume that we model our molecules by strings. We could as well model them with graphs and so on. It'd be more realistic, but let's, well, not necessarily. I mean, we could have, imagine these are random sort of, uh, you know, heteropolymer type, or I forget that they're called copolymer type things, where they're just a, a string of units, A's and B's, and they interact with each other. Um, the uh, Okay, so now how would we make our minimal model that shows, uh, you know, normally in this kind of graph, we deduplicated everything. So what is the graph we want to make that shows, I mean, we're going to now have, I'm a little confused by this. We, we, what we want is an A, B plus a C, A or something goes to a B, you know, whatever it is, plus a, you know, an A, 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 C or something. Well, actually we have the constraint here if we if we assume that this is let, let's not have the constraint that we have to cons well maybe we should why don't okay. we do like a double replacement like a b that's what i was thinking a, a, b, goes a b plus c d goes to a d plus c b something like that a oh, hold on a second so first first approximation uh conserve the number of each character yeah so it's like atoms okay so then what we're going to have is, what we'll have is, let's say we go, let's say that we start off with, you know, A, A, B, C, and we want to take from that, we want to say tuples of that comma two. And then we want to, for each of those, that each of those is one of our sort of proto molecules. And for each of those, we want to take we'll take the complement of, um, so, okay, so here are the claimed reactions we can have. So let's say we have, um, uh, let's say with, whoops, with all equals, whoops, all equals this. Okay, so that's now gonna give me all of those. And then for each of these, I want to say complement of, uh, I want to say the original thing, this is going to get a little tricky, but, but the original thing together with the complement of um, all comma um, that thing. And this is going to not quite give me everything um, because it's not going to give me the permutations of the complement. Oops, what did I do wrong here? I mean, Oops, that's a problem. Uh, you also want to remove duplicates uh, from duples? No, 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 I have a different, yes, I do, but I have a very different problem, which is I don't want the complement because the complement assumes a set theoretic thing. I want to just remove, how do I do this? I want to delete one delete copy. Duplic delete duplicates? No. See, what no. I'm trying to do is if I've got A and B already, I want to remove that from this list and get A and C. Delete cases. I guess, I, I guess that's what I need. I just need delete cases of alternatives. Alternatives applied to it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What is going no, on? No, no. It's because the problem is it's because the A's are all considered identical. What about multi-set complement? Does it, does it preserve order? I know. Let's not worry about order right now. No, complement does not preserve order. No, no, no. Sorts. I understand, but, but you're saying multi-set. Multi -set. You could enumerate it and then apply the labels at the end. Yes, but hold on, multi-set complement. All right, so you're claiming here that I want to say this. How, 
how can the, it's still not right because what it's doing is wait a minute did i oh is the problem the tuples here ah the problem is the tuples the problem is that i want that this is wrong i want the subsets of this which are exactly of size two yeah, so you put the two in print. In I know that's not braces. right either. It's not right either because it's not subsets. There are two identical A's here, and I want to treat them. Okay, I'm being stupid here. Um, you, you understand what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to take the, these things. Okay, you know what? This is a dumb way to do it. Sorry, guys. Look, there's a really simple way to do it. All we do is we say, here we do. Here's, here's what we do. We just take, I mean, this is not exactly a brilliant way to do it, but it certainly will work. We take that and we just say partition comma two. Okay. And I claim that will give us all. All the pairs. Us, all, the, all the possible pairs. So these are, these are things. So what we can have is a reaction is a tuples comma two of these mm -hmm. things. Okay, so that gives us all reactions. But what I don't understand is for this one where it's A, A, and then B, I don't C. think we care. I don't think for chemistry, chemistry is commutative at that level. No, no, but you what know, I mean is, is the first subset the left-hand side and the second no, subset no, the right? No, no, this is, no, okay, this is okay, both okay, the okay, left-hand side. So th this okay. for this case, what we can do here is we can basically say, for these, let me get rid of these stupid ones. Um, we can basically just say, uh, um, okay, so those are the distinct molecular interaction, mole you know. A, B plus A, C. So, so here, just to make it even more, whatever we can say, uh, you know, map string join at level two. Um, is A, C the same as C, A? No, I was thinking not. I mean, okay. it, it, it could be, but it, let's assume it's not. This is a molecule okay. where it matters, but it's that way around. Yep. Okay, okay. So now here... Then our chemical reactions are basically these things. We just say this, and we say uh, tuples of that, comma, two. And we simply say rule at, at, at. Okay, so here are our chemical reactions. So what we want to do is make a mat-like graph, so to speak, that shows... Uh, okay, so we, we start off with some collection of our our chemicals are these pairs. So our initial state might be um, let's see. Ah, string tuples. Oh, this may be a silly function. This is kind of a silly function. I don't even know why I'm doing it this way. This is a dumb way to do it. Well, anyway, <laughs> okay, great. I, I can just take here. I just want, how does this work? Does this just take A, B, C, D? Yeah, okay, fine. Oh, I just had ABC. So my initial state consists of some concentration, some number, uh, combinations of AAs, ABs, ACs, etc. Right? And what I want to represent now is, given that I have some reaction, like this one here, I want to then represent that. How do I do that with token event graphs or some other technology like that? I want to start off with a bunch of these. I want to start off with, let's say here, I want to say, um, here's what I want to do. I want to say random choice 
of this comma 10. Okay, that's my initial state. Now the reaction that I want to take place in this well-stirred initial state, so to speak, is let's say this reaction here. Okay. So that will pick up some of the things from here. So how would I do that? I, I can do that by having, I think I can just do that with a token event graph, can't I? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I say token event graph of, and then I say that's the rule. And then I say that's the initial condition. And then let's say I say three steps. Okay, so that's showing me from my initial state, which has a bunch of things that don't react. This shows me that CB and AA react to produce a BA and a CA. And, and it can oh, do it three different ways. Right, but now what I really want to do here is I want to say token deduplication to false. And then what I should see, okay, there we go. So there's our initial state. This is a little confusing. There's the initial state. And that CB and that AA can react to produce this. See, this is where we're getting messed up. Because this BA is the same BA. Yeah, we're not, we're not assuming. Nick, is there any way to do this? That, that what, we, what we want is every separate... You want to get two different BAs out of this, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Ah, try a new one. Okay. What should I do here? I should do. Tell me how to use this. Just we we'll just click click to copy anywhere on the name, and just use this function instead of this. Yeah. And there is also another option for a token duplication. You can specify none to disable it completely. I am hopelessly mouse challenged here. Um. My God, what's it doing? Okay. Okay, so that didn't. Okay, so now you're saying token deduplication to none, where you're saying that might correspond to the thing that I want here. Oops, not what I wanted to do. None. <coughs> Aha. Okay. All right, I think this is what I wanted. Now, of course, this is forcing me to think about the fact that with really no de token de Okay, so, so the case, let's draw what this would look like if, if we, in, in our, you know, what, wherever it was, what this version of this reaction would look like. Um, And, Wouldn't uh, it just be the Petri net? It's very close to the Petri net. What we want is token deduplication is true. Yeah. And I don't know what we want about event deduplication. Let's look at this separately. Okay, but then what we want to do, so Nick, how do we remove the events here? Because then we get the graph that actually just shows. I don't have an option for that, but. Okay. Well, but, but then what's going to happen is the analog in our chemical reaction network is that we would basically just have, I, I'm really very confused. In the reaction network, I don't usually see 
two different chemicals, or do I? In, in something where I'm looking at um, some synthesis pathway or something, do I typically see two chemicals come in, two chemicals go out, or do I see something different? Well, this is a double replacement reaction, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you, you would often see something like this or two chemicals coming in and one coming out. Um, what does but that you, mean? But what you wouldn't see would be three different events for the same, ostensibly the same thing. No. No, because this is the ensemble. This is, this is in, in, okay, two points. First of all, what, okay, there's different levels here. One is the level of what reaction can happen. The other level is what happens to particular molecules. And the third level is what are all possible things that can happen to molecules. This is that third level. This is showing you all possible ways that CB and AA can get together to do what they're doing. Right? And so any, you know, like in Matt's picture of the hard sphere gas, any particular run of the hard sphere gas is only going to give us, uh, you know, this particular event. It's not going to give us all three events. This is the ensemble of all possible events. Did that make sense? Um, well, it shows all possible events, you know, with three iterations. If you do more, it'll, it'll be different, as is the case I if don't, you do less, right? Is this going to, well, I mean, I don't know, we can, we can change well, why the is it. Why is it that we have three events here? Couldn't it be like four? I mean, because it's basically. Oh, sure. We could have any yeah. number of events. I mean, right. could, exactly. This is, so this, it's, is, this is not all possible. No, no. It's all possible events for this particular, for these particular inputs. And if I go and add to this, I add an additional AA, then what should happen is I should get more events. Okay, okay. What the heck is going on here? Why is there only a single AA shown here? Even though there were two AAs, two distinct AAs in the input, I'm only seeing oh, yeah. one. I'm AA. just, I'm just incorrectly deduplicated now. Just okay. I need to fix it. Okay. Okay. Fine. Well, if it's true, then it's obviously why, because it's deduplicating even across the initial state. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. There are also but, uh, two CBs in the initial. But for, <laughs> but for none, there, okay. should be, there should be three in it. CBs I should just already. fix it for the initial one. I, I just added none today. I just forgot okay. to my, to duplicate the initial state. Okay, fine. All right. So, for not not deduplicating. Right. We can clearly okay. So, but, but roughly what's happening here, again, I'm trying to understand, okay, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to get sort of a formal representation for chemistry at different levels where we have the, uh, so I claim the levels are roughly these. So um, the very lowest level is all possible reactions between every individual molecule, every individual set of molecules. Well, all possible reactions between um, individual molecules. The next level I claim is a particular uh, sequence of reactions between individual molecules. And then up, up eventually there will be a sequence of reactions between molecular species. Does that makes sense. And th this is um, and this is the level at which chemistry is usually done, I claim. 
Do people agree with this? So yeah, any- yeah I, I, I think so because of uh, trying to be compact and, and uh, non-redundant. Yeah, but then the issue here is that both these levels are interesting because between these two levels, this level, let's call them level you know one, two, three, so to speak, um, at level, you know, from level one, level one provides probabilities for level two. Yeah. Level two would just be a particular instantiation of events, correct? Yes, that's correct. And then uh, level, level two gives essentially number densities or concentrations or something for level three, I think. Because what that's saying is, this is a particular sequence of reactions between individual molecules. Yeah. But in this one, uh, you know, in level three, we just count the molecules. We don't, you know, give each one a name, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So whereas in level two, we can have a molecule called Fred and a molecule called Bill or something. At, at level three, they're just, we've got this concentration of these kinds of molecules. Well, then if I follow this correctly, at level one, you're doing the quantum mechanical calculation, whether it's represented by a Schrodinger equation or graphs. Yeah, like graphs. Mm-hmm. And then at level two, you're doing... Um, you're, in, you're doing an, an, a particular reactant in products, and then you're at level three, you're doing. Um, well, so the, 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 the summary will be I think at level one, you're doing statistical mechanics. At level two, you're basically doing, sorry, level one, you're doing quantum mechanics. Level two, you're doing statistical mechanics. Okay. In some sense. And level three, you're doing traditional chemistry, stoichiometry of, of, or something. For yeah. Additional. Yeah. yeah. That would be but, thermochemistry, basically. Yeah. But level two, you would have to have several draws, correct? You would have you would have to do it the uh, instantiation several times. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. To get a, statistical a, mechanics. Yes. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. And collision theory is rolled up in there too. Right. Well, I mean, the, the right this level, when we're drawing these kinds of graphs, wherever they are, the the, the all possibles graph. Hmm. The non-trivial fact from quantum mechanics, in I mean, so so what this is doing? Okay, so this is kind of interesting. I mean, so, um, yeah, because because there's all kinds of path counting and things like this. I'm thinking about this for a second. Yes, yeah, because in in our world, this notion of branchial space and branchial graphs and so on is the story of the all possible different paths thing. And the whole point is that we think we can identify coordinates in branchial space with things like quantum phases. So you're right that that is the, that is the genuine quantum level um, at which, and so everything that happens above that. Okay, so a question is in the physics of what's going on, uh, see, it's, it's interesting because, okay, I, I think actually the quantum mechanics comes in. Yes, here, here's the point. If all we're doing is path counting, we just have classical statistical mechanics. But if we pay attention to the sort of the way in which these different paths interact with each other. In other words, if all we do yeah, right, right. is at every step, we just count the number of this is or that's that, ha- that can occur. That's one thing. But if we look at the relationships between the paths, right. that will give us branchial graph structure and so yes. on. It will give us quantum mechanics. Right. Well, that's fun. I hadn't really <laughs> thought that we could, we could actually have genuinely quantum chemistry. I mean, this is, this is giving us what's really quite interesting about this is I mean, it's, yeah, okay. It's giving us something where 
at the level of chemistry that we would normally care about, where all we care about is concentrations, that's showing us why we don't care about these quantum effects. But if we're interested in correlations between molecules, we might care about quantum effects. In other words, normally, you know, in a typical chemical reaction, you know, your rate equations and so on depend only on the concentration. Of, I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I believe they depend only on the rate of chemical A and the rate of, uh, sorry, the concentration of chemical A times the concentration of chemical B and so on. That gives you, that's what you need is the raw material for the, you know, the rate of the chemical reaction between A and B, correct? Mm -hmm. Technically Whereas, it's an activity, but often it, that's representable by a concentration. Yeah. What is the difference between activity and concentration? So activity and concentration are the same in the, uh, as you get more dilute. I see. More dilute. So, so dilute as in, in a solvent. Uh, yeah. So as a number density goes down. Activity and, con and concentration are the same, are, are representing the same things. But the activity is the deviation from ideal behavior, following in, in the case of a gas, an ideal gas, or in uh, the, um, solutions, I believe it's to bi well, theory, that sort of stuff. Okay. So what you're saying, oh, that's interesting. So, I mean, so you're saying, um, quotes, activity. I think that's, I think that is essentially the point that I'm making is that. I'm saying that, uh, you know, just by characterizing activity is just a number that characterizes the reaction rate, but it is not giving you like the two point correlation function, the two particle correlation functions and all those kinds of things. You're still having a scalar number that characterizes the rate of the reaction. Whereas yes. in reality, if every, let's imagine that after every reaction, and I, you know, again, I don't think this happens as such in chemistry, but let's say after every reaction, well, this is my question. I mean, so th these things react and then, I mean, for example, for example, here's a very naive claim. So they react and now the molecules came in, they collided, they collided in a certain orientation, they reacted and they go out in some other orientation the one effect presumably is that because they're now going out from each other those particular two molecules are very unlikely to react again you know even if ab went to cd and cd goes to ef if it is the case that the fraction of collisions that involve a reaction is very small then the chance that that particular cd will ever see each other again is incredibly low. Well, because it's just the conjunction of the, that probability, right? No, no, but I mean, if I, I'm saying, if what we had was, look, if we had A plus B goes to C plus D, which in turn can go to E plus F. Let's assume that that's the chemistry level representation of this. Mm -hmm. okay? Now let's imagine this is done with actual individual molecules, an A and a B going to a C and a D. The question is, in this sequence, the C and the D that turn into the e, an E and an F, are they? Let, let, let's let's label this with more specificity. So this is an A one plus. By A one, I mean the one that's labeled the particular molecule A one plus particular molecule B one goes to particular molecule, oops, um, let's say C1 plus D1. Okay. But now what I would expect is that C1 plus D, you know, 768 goes to, you know, E1 plus F1, so to speak, if, if that makes sense, right? There's no reason for yep, the yep. D that's there to be the D that came out from the previous reaction. And, and most likely that would be the case gas phase or in solution. Yeah, I mean, it, it probably by an absurd factor that wouldn't yep. happen. Now, yeah. on your friendly catalyst or enzyme, is the same true? If it just got locked in place there, and the reaction happened right there, it's it's much less obvious to me that 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 there isn't such a, you know, that it doesn't trace the same atoms or trace the same molecule, so to speak. 
Yes, uh, that, that does happen, especially in uh, synthase complexes uh, where you have a chain of reactions happening. One of the reactants, um, well, actually, no, you don't have the you don't have this case where uh, the products of one become the reactants of the next. Only one of the products would be a reactant in the next one. Okay. Um, but but you know one of the reactants is passed from one enzyme to the next in the uh, synthetase complex. Uh, okay, this but, happens but... with things like fatty acid synthesis um, and uh, other terpene syntheses. Okay, but the claim that I'm making is the thing that is not being accounted for in the traditional way of thinking about chemistry is, you know, what if there was a correlation between those molecules, that the molecules that came out and the molecules that will be used in the next reaction? Because, okay, why is this relevant? Let's take a, a much, much more gross version of molecular biology. Let's say the immune system. There's a question I'm thinking, trying to think about this. Maybe that's not the right example to choose. Um, I'm trying to understand. Okay, the, the meta claim here is, where is the information stored in, you know, in a molecular biology system? There is information stored in the question of what molecules are present in what concentrations, but what additional information is there in essentially the kinetics or something the, the, um, of, of these individual molecules, particularly in the presence of enzymes and membranes and stuff like this? And what is the, the kind of formal theory that one can use to discuss how that works that isn't the kind of liquid slash the homogeneous li stirred liquid gas phase way of doing standard chemistry. That's, that is the question here. And can we represent these sort of lower levels of chemistry in terms of things like our token event graphs and then understand what, what kind of averaging we are doing? See, because what I would guess is that in a first approximation, the averaging is just fine but that there's a finer granularity where it isn't fine. Now, I mean, in terms of, of uh, kinetic theory, for example, the, um, I mean, the way this will be represented, and I know it is a, a thing, okay, there's the Boltzmann equation, which tells you the individual reactions between molecules. And then there are the whole BBGKY hierarchy of things that involve not just number density functions, but joint probability distributions for pairs of molecules, for example, and those the effects there on, uh, you know, uh, the, the rate of a reaction in the, at higher levels in this hierarchy uh, is determined by these two point, you know, two particle correlation correlated probabilities. Matt, did you ever, have you studied this stuff yet? Yeah, and I, I guess the thing that keeps popping into my head as you're talking about this is like the thing which exists at the very bottom of the, or the top of the BBGKY hierarchy, whichever end of it is this, the sort of um, chemical reaction augmented version of the hard sphere causal graph, right? So if we allow for the existence of multiple types of nodes, so we have elastic collisions and then inelastic collisions where chemical reactions occur, the BBGKY hierarchy is built on top of that, right? Because it's built from the individual position and momentum uh, yes. variables in phase space. Um, I'm not sure. So I, I guess, you know, you're asking where the information is stored. Um, in some sense, it has to be stored in this sort of augmented version of the causal graph. It might not be stored very usefully there, but... Well, right, but the question is, does that matter? In other words, it could be the case that in, you know, in, in your typical gas, the second order correlation. So, I mean, this is the confusion, the formal confusion of second order of thermodynamics, Boltzmann's equation, et cetera. You know, there is this formal issue of two molecules come in, they, they interact, they, uh, they repartition their energy momentum, 
and uh, they go out again. Um, and you know, Boltzmann had the derivation of the H theorem, the law of entropy increase, based on saying, assume the two molecules are uncorrelated before they collide, then they collide, and then these things happen. The difficulty is that it isn't true that th th that's a very time asymmetric statement, because if you assume that they're uncorrelated before they collide, they will then necessarily be correlated after they collide, because after all, they just collided. Yeah, sure. And the, the question of whether it is, in fact, correct to take them to be uncorrelated before they collide, in fact, it's not correct. In fact, they have all kinds of elaborate correlations. It's just that those correlations don't matter if all you're trying to measure is some, is some total reaction rate based on concentration. Yeah. And so the issue is, if what one is measuring is, you know, but, but so for example, the second row of thermodynamics would simply be untrue if, or, or it will be incompatible with reversibility and so on, if this whole story about molecular chaos was correct. It's not, but that the incorrectness of that story has not stopped anybody using entropy, you know, free energy, all these kinds of chemistry arguments, even though those arguments must necessarily break down when you do the full sort of thing where you're not assuming this molecular chaos assumption. Um, but it doesn't matter. It has not mattered to chemistry so far. But this is the question. Does it in fact matter in molecular biology? And... Um, Yeah. So, I mean, I think that the, you know, the roadmap, as I see it, for understanding this is to take the formalisms that we have, like token event graphs, causal graphs, these kinds of things, and try to nail down essentially this, this hierarchy here. Um, and yes, I was, uh, RBS on our live stream is mentioning that should do the standard ruleological thing of just looking at all possible reactions here and seeing what consequences they have for, um, and yes, that's the obvious thing to do. And the, the thing that was actually kind of started, this was a discussion a couple of days ago about, um, uh, about the signature of life in a chemical reaction network. And what, for example, in, in well, here's a question for the, 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 um, for Bob and others. When, when I look at this big chart, there are lots of cycles here. If I looked at the corresponding chart for a chemical plant, would I find cycles or not? You mean uh, a, a commercial production plant, right? Yep, yep. Uh, yeah, uh, you, you would find cycles where things get, uh, you know, certainly solvent and things like that uh, would get reused. Um, all right, so the, here's my question. If you show me this picture, right? If, so, so for example, if, if I were to look at, um, uh, I look at this picture and then I look at your average chemical engineering, you know, fairly complicated chemical engineering plant. Mm -hmm. Can I tell that one is biology, that one is chemical engineering, or can I not tell? I guess it would be, it would depend largely on how complete it was. I mean, the... The, the uh, chemical engineering plant would have many, many fewer reactions in it. There would be some cycles where things get reused, um, especially things like catalysts or whatever. Um, if, yeah, um, it would just be much simpler. Okay. So, they could, so it could be controlled. That's a nice. So there we go. Cool. Okay. That's cool. Okay, but 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 that's a statement of like saying, you know, that that's that's an interesting claim that biology is just like a chemical plant that got out of control, so to speak. That's a more complicated version of the same thing. And for example, these autocatalytic set things, which I don't understand very well. How do those relate? Does anybody here know how those work? That's um okay, but in any case, the, the the um my question is uh you know 
what features okay the the basic claim being made here is that the okay th this is this is a little bit related to what we've just been doing with math mathematics where we're asking the question there is theorem proving in meta mathematics and there is just finding theorems naturally occurring in the entailment cones of axioms and the intentionally found theorems are not convincingly different from the just random theorems that show up in the entailment cones of axioms. So I suppose that's a, an analogy to this question about whether the chemical networks here, um, how those relate to what uh, sort of the, the um, uh, to what happens in biology. Well, anyway, look, I, we should probably wrap up in a moment here, but, but um, uh, all right, so the thing we're trying to understand is, I mean, does this, um, James, do you think this is a, a well-defined, I mean, we've got a path here of some kind, which is trying to understand what is our minimal model, you know, this, this A, B goes to C, D, well, I'm, and now I'm using the A's and B's and C's and D's differently, but, but this kind of idea where we have a, Okay, in in a lot of in our standard string rewriting systems, we take a single string, we rewrite it to multiple strings. Here, we're always taking pairs of strings, combining them. In a first approximation, we assume it's well stirred, so every string can combine with every other string, and we can do so. One naive thing we can do is straight path counting. That should give us precisely chemical stoichiometry. If we do that, if we say we have 100 AAs and, and 17 CBs, we should be able to get the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the I, number I of it. reactions should be exactly what we would expect from chemical stoichiometry. Right. Um, and then the claim is that if we deduplicate the events and we do du de deduplicate the tokens, we should get a Petri net. And in particular, we should get something where, because we counted the number of tokens, we should get this thing which, confusingly, in Petri nets is also called tokens, though means a different thing. That is the number of instances, effectively, of a given, uh, you know, in a, in a Petri net, right? There are yeah. these places. And what we're saying is the tokens, in that sense, are the number of copies of molecule X, which are represented in the Petri net as being are uh, named the number of tokens at place X. In our case, what it would be is the, uh, this is, we have tokens and each token is essentially a separate instance of a molecule and we have types of tokens, so to speak. Um, and we can count the number of types of token that we can then, so we should be able to then get precisely Petri nets as, um, and, but then the sort of, even below this level is what we're seeing in, you know, Matt's causal graph, where it matters that the structure of that causal graph depends on the positions of the hard spheres. Right. It's not just a, a you know, that is not a well-stirred collection of hard spheres. The causal graph for a well-stirred collection of hard spheres well, the multi-way causal graph is just a, a graph where everything bounces off everything at every step. Right. So then we have this question of does the microscopic sort of kinetics of the whole thing affect what happens? Um, well, the causal graph seems like it would be a good place to explore the not well stirred Yes, sort of lifting that lifting that assumption, right? Because you can actually construct a specific molecular dynamic simulation where you don't have all of these things sort of. Uh, right. So then a, a very interesting thing to do there would be to have a toy causal graph where you're not actually computing a causal graph, but you have something which has the correct properties to be a causal graph, so to speak. And there may very well be generic facts about how these reactions work that hold for any causal graph that would not hold for any well-stirred system. 
Does that make sense? Because the causal graph, you know, when we have that causal graph, wherever it was, when we have that causal graph, this causal graph has character. Okay, in a well stirred system, every what would happen? Every edge. Yes, every edge would lead to essentially a single event that leads out to the other edges. Whereas here, there is it matters that this particular event causes that event causes this event, but this event over here is quite independent of the events happening over here. That's not accounted for in a well stirred system. Quick question. So, yeah. Uh, right now we're using strings, arbitrary strings. How difficult do you think would it be to get some crude functionality where we're actually simulating substitutions even, you know, with on molecules? I doubt it's that difficult, except that these guys are saying are talking about different kinds of bonding and and you know random things in cages and not in cages. No, I so I know generating the general capability poses some challenges but if we just wanted to create some sort of crude you know limited uh limited functionality that we could start using you know soon how difficult would that be using graph rewriting you mean basically to representing molecules More or less, yeah yeah i mean that's what you say you're working towards anyway for reaction yeah. So I have a function for uh, rewriting molecules using a chemical reaction. I do not know if it's going to be useful to you guys. Um, so what kind of chemical reaction? This is the template reaction, right, Jason? Right. I mean, uh, ones that you can write using uh, molecule patterns, I guess. Uh, can you give us an example? Way. No, I, not, at the, not off the top of my head. Uh, I did some work. Weird. Yeah, I mean, in general, like pattern matching kind of stuff won't work because they're atomic objects. Um, what do you mean they're atomic objects? Molecules mean, are right. So <laughs> atomic in the sense, of, <laughs> yeah, atomic in our sense of being exactly, indivisible, yes. computationally indivisible, right, even right. though they're chemically. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Too many atoms. Uh, um, but. Okay, but, but I mean, the question that James is asking is, could we do this? I think it's not going to matter that much in a lot of the theoretical work that we're doing, whether they're strings or actual graph molecules. It will be interesting to see, it might be intuition building to see this work with actual chemical reactions of kinds that are relevant in biology, for example. But I think in terms of, I mean, now, but for, you know, the, but for now, should we just meta model those with strings? Is that what you're I think suggesting? So. Yeah, what yeah. Suggesting. I, I, well, we just did this afternoon with with the ABC case. Mm -hmm. um, looks very, it, you know, it it looks promising to me as a way we could begin to model this. Right, and I mean, and have some specificity about the individual tokens. Right, and and to be fancier, we would end up with something where you can have growing strings, for example, that would represent. I mean, there's there's the possibility of an unbounded collection of possible molecular species, but that's not what we're doing here. I mean, that is not the story of well, it's chemical engineering when you have polymers being formed. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I was just gonna say. yeah. Um, the, uh, but here's a naive question: in in the history of chemistry, you know, the whole idea of polymers and plastics and so on is like a bit more than a hundred years old, if I understand correctly, and was that a conceptual big deal that people didn't, or, or was the atomic theory so young that nobody even noticed the issue? That this question of whether in a chemical reaction you can create molecules that have never been seen before, is that, was that a big deal or did nobody, did nobody notice that? Maybe we don't know the history of chemistry well enough. I, I don't know enough of the history, you're right. Yeah, fair enough. Um, but but I mean in in the question okay so the issue one issue is see see I think it's going to matter and I just don't know how we meta model membranes and enzymes and things like this 
By the way, when there's an enzyme and it gets used for a reaction, I assume that same enzyme is used like millions of times. Is that true? The enzyme yes. does not get used up. And it, what is that number? Is the number a million, a trillion? A, you know, what, what's the number of the number of different, you know, a single enzyme molecule? How many times would it be reused? That I don't know. Um, the only similar number I can think of would be the number of times that a messenger RNA would be used to uh, do the um, transcription for more proteins. What's the answer to that? Uh, I have one example where they were modeling it 